My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. Before we start, let's go to Steve Leisman, who has some breaking news. Hello? Steve, it's Jim. You've got me. You're live. The Federal Reserve announcing yet another program, the primary dealer credit facility. This is one of the biggest programs the Federal Reserve has yet to do. Uh, it is, uh, call it the kitchen sink of lending programs. It provides short-term, uh, overnight, and term funding up to 90 days for a very broad range of assets. I can tell you the kinds of assets that now primary dealers can bring to the Fed to get funding. Investment grade corporate debt securities, international agency securities, commercial paper, municipal securities, mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities, even equity securities excluding ETFs. Um, this is sort of the Emma Lazarus of bring us your poor, your tired, your hungry, your weak. The Fed is saying bring us your paper. We'll obviously give it a haircut, but we'll also lend it to you overnight. So now the Fed implementing almost all, still a few left, of the financial crisis era programs from the uh, Great Recession that it had in place today. It put in place the commercial paper facility. It already has a, uh, really launched a quantitative easing program and bringing rates down to zero. Jim? What is left in terms of the, the areas of pressure that you see? I'm sorry, I don't hear Jim. Well, all right. Well, look, I tell you, thank you so much, Steve. And now we know exactly how serious the Fed is. We know everybody else is getting pretty serious. And that should help tomorrow's opening. I do believe it's real. OK, well, let, let's uh, get back to mad money now. We are at the beginning of the most treacherous phase of this COVID bear market. The point where the strongest stocks rally like crazy and the weakest ones, well, the weakest ones, they retreat right into the wilderness. We saw that all today with travel and leisure airlines. That's the big story today. Dow gaining 1,049 points, making up some of that loss from yesterday. S&P jumping 6%. NASDAQ falling 6.23%. In other words, this market is now going into triage mode, just like the hospitals in Europe and soon here. The winners are trading like winners, and the losers are trading like there is no hope at all for the shareholders, for you. This bifurcation is why I kept warning you that index funds are not the right way to invest here. The winners and losers are just so obvious to you and me. Come on. They, well, we don't need to own the bad with the good. In many ways, that's what we want to see. I mean, it means the market is working. It's looking at the fundamentals of individual companies. So then why did I say it's treacherous? Because we're going to have so much bad news coming over the next couple of weeks about the illness, not necessarily about the assets, but the illness, that it's too dangerous to come in here and start buying today's winners after today's spring-loaded run, although I think those stocks in particular have put in a bottom. Beyond that, there's some good news and some bad news. We're going to start with the bad news. Why? Because I'm kind of a Bad news first guy. First, we are a service economy. Two-thirds of our GDP is based on the vast service sector. And this virus is devastating the service industries. We can't congregate. But that's how these companies make money. Sold-out stadiums, crowded restaurants, flights to somewhere warm, trips to the mall, even trips to the gym or the hair salon or the oldest of American traditions grabbing a beer. These are all out. In some places, they're illegal and with good reason. More than 100 million people work in the service sector. You heard me right. 100 million people. Not all of them will lose their jobs. But we're looking in, at an unfathomable number of layoffs here. In theory, it could be worse than the Great Depression because the whole ecosystem of service is being eroded, if not destroyed. Thriving institutions are being mowed down right alongside struggling ones. The number of retailers on the verge of going under is staggering. Small ones, sole proprietors, giant chains that employ tens of thousands. Same goes for restaurants. Really good companies are getting wrecked. Casinos, hotels, every aspect of hospitality, you name it. I can't even look at some of the prices of some of these retailers. I mean, we got retailers that traded at, eight, at 80. Now they're at 8. I mean, this happened overnight. Second, when it comes to fighting COVID-19, we were way behind the curve, but now we're ramping up. And we're ramping up testing, too. That's good. But it means we're about to see some huge spikes in the number of infected people, the so-called denominator, because we finally have the capacity to diagnose them. Now, it could have been wor far worse. But the fact is, we're still nowhere near the peak. And when we get there, it's going to knock down everything, including many of the stocks that surged higher today. The infections and the death toll will soar, possibly overwhelming our healthcare system and forcing doctors to make horrific decisions about who lives 
and who dies. Third, outside the service sector, two of the largest industries in America are being challenged at the exact same time. Just bad luck here. Oil and aerospace. The Russians and the Saudis are flooding the world with crude, undercutting our producers. The Permian's in trouble. Meanwhile, Boeing can't get approval for the redesigned 737 MAX, once its most lucrative product line, and its customers, the airlines, are on the ropes. We know Boeing is seeking tens of billions of dollars in aid. i got some thoughts on how to do that later in the show. Okay, it's not just a parade of horribles. It's a macabre dance of death and destruction. And I wanted to put it to you right up top. Now, let's talk about why the market was up today, because there are signs that there's an other side to this pandemic, as in we might come out on the other side once this is over, particularly fueled by a huge amount of stimulus. No one's cheering, but the federal government finally is recognizing the scale of what's ahead of him. Hate him or like him. The president has put together an A-list team to tackle the illness. The redoubtable Dr. Tony Fauci doing with the disease. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin trying to make sure that working people, not the fat cats, not the millionaires, but working people come out in one piece. These are both Herculean tests. Again, though, there's some good news here. We're now getting millions of testing kits, many made by last night's guest, Thermo Fisher. That's a start. We have data that shows this virus can be carried by nearly anyone, but the death rate is heavily skewed toward the elderly with pre-existing conditions. The numbers are so stark, it's easy to see why Dr. Fauci is more worried about young people who think they're invincible getting infected and then giving it to their much more at-risk older relatives. If we ring to the elderly so that they don't come in contact with anyone under 40, that could make a huge difference. Then, my favorite, because it is still mad money, the ingenuity factor. Tonight, we're hearing from Regeneron, which is having some success, maybe a lot of success, with an anti-inflammatory drug that suppresses some of the virus's most lethal symptoms. And they also have high hopes for a possible vaccine much sooner than I thought. Don't scoff. Regeneron conquered Ebola. They might have something and have something in record time. Meanwhile, Gilead's testing one of their antivirals. We don't know enough. Who knows? But it could be good. Others are using Plaquenil, malaria drug. I think there's a possibility of success there. It's a mistake to bet against American ingenuity over the long haul. How long? Anybody's guess. But I'm not taking the other side of that trade. Finally, let's deal with the economy. I'm beginning to be heartened by some of the moves from the private sector, not just the public. Later, we're speaking with Sheryl Sandberg. She's Facebook's chief operating officer. She only had a $100 billion program to help 30,000 small businesses across over 30 countries. Now, some problems, though, are so big they can only be solved by the federal government. Washington needs to step up with unemployment insurance and what Mnuchin has said would be a trillion dollars in the economy. I wish that, there were, that, 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 that that were enough. This is a Malcolm X moment. When it comes to people who are in danger of being wiped out by something beyond their control, the government needs to, to help by any means necessary. Maybe that's what Leesman was getting at. Maybe that's the trick. If the Fed just guarantees pretty much everything, we're back to 2007, 2008, but more terra firma. The president and the Treasury Secretary are talking about business interruption insurance. I'm counting on that insurance going to small, medium-sized businesses. And to the 1099 workers, the sole proprietors who are being torn asunder by COVID, by something they didn't have anything to do with. Government's got to put money into the hands of small business owners to meet payroll. If they do, we can tide them over until the economy comes back, as long as they keep them on payroll. $1.2 trillion. I know it sounds like a lot. It's not enough. It's roughly the size of the bank problems of 2007, but this is bigger and harder, and the money has to get there faster, whether it be through the IRS or the mail. I don't know, TurboTax. My advice, think big. Perhaps Steve's announcement will help. I'm waiting on Treasury Secretary Mnuchin for even more details. Yes, the market rallied today, but the stocks that rallied are the wrong ones. They're the ones that have the strong enough balance sheet to survive regardless. They can come out on the other side of the hiatus because COVID is crushing their rivals. Walmart surged more than 11% today. Why? Massive stimulus in the form of direct payments, but also because their smaller competitors could be wiped out. Amazon soared 7%. E-commerce thrives when people are staying at home. Food and drug stocks that I've been recommending all along, they finally exploded higher. Recession proof. At these levels, I think you actually need to wait for another pullback before you buy some of these, like the General Mills. I mean, gee, the General Mills up five. That's not right. It's just not right. I think we've seen a bottom, though, in those stocks. They need to be bought on pullbacks. What's still safer? Utilities. They're impervious to weaker economy. Boy, by a lower interest rate than you're ever going to see ever again. 
The bottom line, though, it feels like a tart moment. The market rocketed higher after Congress passed the bank bailout in October of 2008. Then it was followed by another horrendous decline in the stock market as the system kept falling apart. Just like back then, we're finally moving in the right direction. But I think we need to overcome more looming bad news about the virus and about bankruptcies before the whole indices can bottom even again, as many stocks have already put in the bottom. Okay, let's take some calls. Let's go to Larry in Florida. Larry! Jimmy, chill. Not that chill, but that's okay. That's okay. What's up? So following a relentless post-merger beatdown with uncertainty about execution of the company's streaming platforms, now with the cancellation of March Madness and other sports due to be broadcast, what are your thoughts on Viacom CBS for this year and the next? Okay, uh... I have a conference call tomorrow with club members of the ActionLearnersPlus.com club. And on it, I'm going to eat not crow, but I think the many crows that were uh, in, the, in the movie The Birds, where they got to the Su- Suzanne Pochette. I mean, it, it was just one of my worst picks. I got to talk about why it was so bad, but it wasn't my, well, it's my fault because my chapel trust owns it. But we're going to address that, Larry. And, well, you know what? They can't all be good ones. All right, we're moving in the right direction. But I do think there's more bad news, virus, more bad news, bankruptcies that we have to overcome before the whole indices bottom, although, again, some stocks have bottomed already. On Man Money Tonight, a potential breakthrough on a coronavirus drug. Today, after Regeneron said it, it aims to have a potential COVID-19 drug ready for clinical trials by early summer. This is news, people. There's news. News. Talking to the chief science officer of the company. And I like what I'm going to hear, I think, then, regardless of how the COVID-19 pandemic plays out. It has already been brutal for small business. So let's go to Facebook Cheryl Sandberg about how the company's $100 million grant program, money in the pockets of small business right now, can help. And as telemedicine emerges as a necessity in the fight against coronavirus, I'm talking with private player Amwell. Find out how its client base of more than 240 health systems, including 2,000 hospitals, are relying on the new technology. So stick with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. 